Hi, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about the ancient world, classical education, and old stuff uh-huh. put on by three classical scholars. Wow. Uh, seems like a bold claim. My name is Graham Donaldson. I am here with Thomas Fletcher Magby. Hello. Classical scholar. Uh, yes, indeed. C.S. It. Can we, Thomas can we, Magby C.S. Can yes. we put comma C.S. after and all of our names? Arthur Yawn, otherwise uh, affectionately known as A.J. Hannenberg mm. C.S. <laughs> I like this, boys. I like this. Um, we teach... Uh, at a classical Christian school in Austin, Texas, called Veritas Academy, and we come every week into your car, your homes, your cell phones, in order to bring you the best of the ancient world and our hot takes. <laughs> the the best of the ancient world. We're the arbiters. We're yeah. the arbiters. Uh-huh. We're the we get to pick. Yes. Yeah. We're we curators the of the ancient makers. world. Yes. If oh, we haven't wow. talked about it, it's it not worth writing it ain't down. Nothing. Seems about right. Anyway. Um, and gentlemen, I promised myself that I would be above board and then I would not make any jokes, even though that this is the number two podcast about duty. On duty. Ah! <laughs> On duty. <clears throat> number two. Hamburg, could you <laughs> please te- teach us about Cicero and duty. The, our aughts? Oh. Okay, somewhat convicted of the disorganized nature of my last podcast on Cicero, I I just didn't think it was very good. So I've, I've endeavored to make this one better. So if it's not, I didn't do it right. <laughs> <laughs> but you tried. That's what, that's I, but I tried matters. really hard to yeah. make it good. So let's uh, let's just jump right in. So last time we talked about Cicero's On Duty Book One, and On Duty Book One, I just isn't I it so good? Yeah, it. I say duty so much. Uh, on Duty Book One is about how to just be a good person, right? Mm-hmm. And it has our four different divisions of how to do that. Number one, a full perception and development of the true. In other words, be smart, not dumb. Number two, conservation of an organized society. Be kind, just, and charitable. Number three, have a great, noble, and strong soul. Right, Do hard things with an indifferent spirit. And number four, generally be a gentleman in all sorts of other things. Manners. I'm into it. So this is good. Be smart, it. be kind, just, and charitable. Do hard things, and be a gentleman. Be smart, not dumb is how I start every one of my classes. <laughs> At the beginning of every year. How that works? He actually, it's a call and response. Be smart, not not dumb. dumb. Yeah. Oh, I'm adding that to my catechism. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. It is, it has been somewhat convicting for me on a a personal note, because this comes, like reading this comes right in the middle of sort of a self inventory about virtue and vices. Uh, So I don't know. Reading Cicero has been especially effective for me recently, right? So if you are out there thinking about your own virtue and vice and needing to go through sort of a rundown of everything, he might not be the best, but it certainly doesn't hurt to hear what Cicero thinks on all these things. There are definitely worse people you can go to. Than Cicero? Tony Robbins. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Yeah, there's all kinds of bad self-help out there. And this just, I mean, it's it's not ringing any new bell. It's just saying again and again, the same old thing. Have the virtues. Be just. Be charitable. All these things were important to men who weren't even Christian, right? Right. I think, I'm pretty sure he was pre-Christian, wasn't he? Yes, he was. I don't know. Julius Caesar, yeah. 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 He was. Yeah. In all fairness, I've never read Tony Robbins. He may be the Cicero of our times, and I have no idea. People love him. Yeah, but, yeah. He's okay. a big deal for like Silicon Valley entrepreneur type. All right. So I don't okay. know if that means anything. Yeah. All right. So jumping in, let me ask you boys a question because mm-hmm. we're moving from what is good to what is expedient. That's what book two is mm. all about. What is expedient? What is practical? Podcasting. Yes. Obviously. Yeah, that's totally. why we're here. What is the best way to get what you want? Material goods, wealth, success. What is what is the best avenue to take to get there? Help enough people get what they want, and then you'll get what you want. That's uh, Zig Ziglar, I think. Cloak and dagger back channeling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so back channeling. By the way, listener, if you hear random yells and hollers, we're right at the end of the school day, and the kids are you know stumbling down the halls and dragging their backpacks. And uh, they don't not sound like they're dragging their backpacks. They sound like it's an organized flash mob out there. <laughs> they are kicking and screaming and singing, singing and yeah. dancing and dancing somewhere. Okay. So you you say help enough people get what they want and you uh-huh. can get what you want. Uh-huh. So how how does that reasoning work? So if your goal is profit, you get profit by selling something that people want that meets a need. So by meeting meeting enough people's need, you get money, which is a goal of business. Which is what? So this is more of a business oriented thing. If sure. I sell enough products, I will get what I want. Or even if you're trying to 
make your way up through an organization. You have a boss. If you help that boss meet their goals, then that boss will like you and promote you. You can get what you want through promotion that way. If you are in politics and you want to get something passed, you do favors for other people and then they, um, they want to help you back. They pass your legislation. You help them so that they want to help you. So it seems like all of that is based a little bit on self-interest. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes. So help enough people, they will want to help you. Which we, So you start from a place of everyone is self-interested, but for you to achieve your self-interest, you must help other people's. This okay. is the, like how to win friends and influence, influence people. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and again, I'm not making a moral claim. This is a, yeah. how to win friends and influence people is like say people's names a lot and they'll like you. Like it's, it, it makes no judgment of the type of friend you're making. Yeah, Thomas, I think you're right on that, Thomas. Thank you. I appreciate that, Graham. That's so great, Graham. Okay. <laughs> hey, Jay, what do you think? Uh, I think whatever you want is <laughs> good. Thank whatever you. Whatever you want great. me to think good. is what hey, I'll Jay, think. that's a great point. Yes. Graham, <laughs> <laughs> do you, why, why the back channeling? I assume you're being facetious. A little bit, but I mean, like, it's sort of maybe the Machiavellian uh, way of thinking about getting what you want. Um, and I think maybe Machiavelli the Machiavellian way is also Thomas, he, he would agree with what you're saying, which is, you know, um, get people on your side and then they will do favors for you. Um, it's like very Italian mobster. Um, I was being a little, yes, I was being facetious, but it's the idea of, you know, it could be just as purely basic as like, um, set a goal and like go for it. Like a lot of people don't, Think have about goals. goals. Okay, so have goals. see what you want and get. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, so, so I mean, um, um, and brush up to the borders of your own personal um, uh, um, capacities for ethical behavior, as, or go as far, as far, you know, push the envelope as far as you're willing to push it. Okay. I think a lot of people sort of operate with that mentality. All right, I got you. All right, Cicero says. That I think he aligns more with Thomas than the, than the back channeling. Point Magby. He pretty much says men are the way to get everything. But he gets to it in a different way. Not necessarily through self-interest. But he says everything there is, everything we have or want, comes through the artistry, industry, or concern of men. How do we get gold? Well, it had to be mined. How do we mine it? Men. People. Dudes. Right. People. Uh, if we want to be a lawyer, we got to learn laws. That involves learning from people. It involves having people do things they probably shouldn't do. How do we get clothing? Well, we have to grow crops. That's people. We have to harvest the crops. That's people. I mean, yes, some of it now is automated. It wasn't as much in their time. Do you guys hear that? Guys hear that? It sounds like a ghost, maybe? Is that... So it's the ghost of Cicero. Whoa, <laughs> He's a 15-year-old boy in the hallway. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> I don't know if the listeners can hear that, Probably but it's, it's yeah. just a sort of a whoo, like a howling outside. Yeah. So he says, because everything there is, even material goods that we could want or be concerned with comes from the industry of men. Men are the way that you get the things that you want. Right. So here's a couple of quotes. One, either as a general in war or as a statesman at home could have accomplished the great things of the benefit of the state without the hearty cooperation of other men. So who who is there that would say that's not true? Right. So. The men is the way you get to the top of business. Men is the way you get to success in war. Here's another one. Since, therefore, there can be no doubt on this point that man is the source of both the greatest help and the greatest harm to man, I set it down as the peculiar function of virtue to win the hearts of men and to attach them to one's own service. So not only do men provide the avenue for success, Hmm. they also typically provide the greatest hindrance right? They're the guys that can bring you down, right? Political opponents, people that don't like you, people that steal from you. It's all men. Yes, granted, there are catastrophes, right? The wind can blow your house down. That's a bummer. But it is men that will help you to put it back up. Right. Or even that weather is so out of your control, it's not even worth trying to predict. But with people, you can treat them differently, right? You can treat men differently, and then they'll like you or dislike you based on how you act. And that you're focusing on what you have control over. Yeah, exactly. So, so learn the hearts of man because they are statistically the most likely to benefit you or hinder you. Yeah, I mean, he goes so through... I'm wasting time studying jaguars. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> are you well, taming jaguars? I'm or? terrified of jaguars. Oh, it's, that, that's that's sti- why you read up on them? Apparently, they're statistic- sti- uh, they are statistically low in destroying me in Texas. They are. Hmm. statistically low, but I would say that the person that can really hurt you is the zookeeper. Yes, He's the guy that lets the jaguar go, (laughs) right? So he actually lists, he says, God, there are gods, there are men, there are animals, and there's inanimate objects. Well, all of those things are typically wielded by men. And the gods, people say they generally want to do us good. 
So, you know, we're going to leave them out. It's man that can do the greatest good and the greatest harm. So, so well, he, I'm just curious. So Graham brought up Machiavelli. So and Jaguars and Jaguars. I'm going to focus on the Machiavelli part. So Machiavelli will eventually say that it's better to be uh, feared than loved. But you're talking about going after the hearts of men. Is Cicero? Would you say that he's saying it's better to be loved than feared? Oh man, you are preempting. What I, up? You are ex- yeah. Wait, what that's, up? It's like it's like you and Cicero, same wavelength. Oh, you know. So is Machiavelli reimagining? Like, is he reinterpreting, or, or is he in conversation with Cicero on this? Could be. Oh. I haven't read any Machiavelli. Hmm. A lot of people, yeah, because Machiavelli is pure pragmatist. Yeah, yeah. So in Cicero's, some sense, yes. But that's the thing: is Cicero is saying oh, this, that this is, this actually is what's expedient. practical, yeah. right? He is saying it is practical to win the hearts of men. Yeah. All right, so let's sure. let's keep yeah. moving. Sorry, yeah. He says there are um, three ways to win men. Right, we win them by wisdom and virtue. So he breaks this down into three heads: wisdom, the ability to perceive what in any given instance is true and real, what its relations are, its consequences, and its causes. So just basically knowing what's going on. Mm-hmm. So having wisdom, having temperance, which is the ability to restrain the passions and make the impulses obedient to reason. So again, going back to the tripartite soul, being able to make sure that your impulses stay where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And three, justice, the skill to treat with consideration and wisdom, those with whom we associate. And all of this is in order so that we can do the following things. Supply our natural wants, ward off impending trouble, avenge ourselves when we need to, (laughs) and visit them with the retribution as justice and humanity will permit. (laughs) Wow. So I like that he, he he takes a big hard line on you know, retribution, but it's weird that the way we get there is wisdom and justice and virtue, right? Temperance, wisdom and justice. All right. He says, so, so moving further into how to get people to give you what you want, he says, there are different ways that people will either give things to you, uh, from their goodwill, from, if they're in a higher position or will submit to you as a person in higher position. And that's what you're going for, right? Either they give you goods when they are in position over you, or they will submit to you under your position. Mm. So the six heads to get people that are maybe above you to get you to give you stuff. Number one, goodwill. Number two, esteem or some vague notion that you deserve it. Maybe you were working really hard, right? So maybe they're like, ah, that guy's got a good work ethic. Mm. I'm going to give him a raise. Three, they have confidence in you and it's for their own self-interest. So this is going back to what you said, right. Megby, where if I do enough things for other people, <clears throat> They're going to, they're going to do it for me. So yep. maybe he says like, if I give this guy a raise, he's going to work harder and I'll, I'll get that return. Or yeah. like work, work your way into a position where they eventually realize that they kind of need you for them to continue working at their capacities or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You are, you are necessary. You're they indis- need you for indispensable them. to them now. Yeah. Number four, they may fear your power. I call this the mugger clause, right? Oh One way that you get people to give stuff to you is to threaten them. Yeah. Right. Or blackmail. That's that's one surefire way. Number five. Wait, wait, but is that is that all he says about fear your power? Is just, no. There's more just coming like about power. The bat and there, like, okay. we'll talk more about power in a little bit. But he's just listing the different ways that people will gotcha. give stuff to you. Okay. Number six. They may be moved by promise or payment of payment or reward. So you can bribe them. You can say, "Give me a raise, and I will let you use my beach house in mm-hmm. the summers." Right. There you go. Mm-hmm. There's your six reasons. And then the ways to get people to submit to you. Number one, goodwill. Same as above. Number two, gratitude for generous favors, right? If you're like, hey, I'll do all this stuff for you. And they're like, great, I'll follow you into battle. Number three, the eminence of others' social position or, Mm. again, self-interest. So, yeah. Number four, fear that they might be forced to submit. So they're like, yeah, I'll follow you. Just don't don't hit me. Mm. Uh, Number five, they might be captivated by the hope of gifts of money and by liberal promise. And number six, bribery. (laughs) So like the exact same. There's, yeah, a lot, there's a lot close. of repeat at the end. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of repeat. They kind of mirror each other all the way. Yeah. And he says that the best way is number one. Goodwill. Goodwill. Totally. Right? Nothing here is better than love and nothing is worse than fear. Number four. Fear that they may be, may be forced to submit or f- they might fear your power. The mugger clause. That He says that is the no, the worst. I mean. But best is goodwill. Worst is fear. Fear is the mind killer. <laughs> <laughs> But For those who haven't read Dune, uh, you should read Dune. Should it's read a great Dune, book. Yeah. yeah. But it still works, he says. You can still use bribery. You still can use rewards. Yeah. It's you just not you very can still good. use those things. It's not very good. He actually says that with servants, you might have to use fear if nothing else works, right? If mm-hmm. they don't love you and they won't submit to any of those other things, you might just have to threaten them. What about students? 
I was thinking about this. Like, do so just following with that then. So like in Graham's class, should he be starting with goodwill from day one? And then when goodwill doesn't work, move down or should he start from the bottom and like be really mean? From the bottom. I mean, uh, <laughs> good. I, he should absolutely start with goodwill. Start with goodwill. I think goodwill. Yeah. I mean, makes the most sense in terms of students wanting to work or just, you know, yeah, yeah. Goodwill. If the students have, have, love for you or the class or the, or somehow the subject material that will write a lot of wrongs that just the fear of a bad grade won't. But I'm asking, will that, do they come in from day one and goodwill works perfectly or do you have to start? Oh, I think you have to build up goodwill. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are ways as teachers that for the first couple of weeks, I'm very careful about the way I act and the way I treat them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's easier at different ages. Like the seniors, I think, are easier with goodwill because they're seniors. They're kind of one foot out the door. They've been doing this for a while. We have had them before as mm-hmm. students. Um, but maybe, maybe you want to say, maybe you, your experience is different, but my my guess is like ninth graders probably have a hard, like you need to build, I, my experience, I don't teach any ninth grade classes. My experience is that they need, is that, that you have, AJ, more of a challenge to get goodwill because they're just kind of, grumps sometimes yeah i think you just have to prove that just because of age in high school and they're terrified of bigger kids and all sorts of things yeah you have to prove that you sort of understand them and that you were uh, one of the most important is that you are just Mm -hmm. teenagers suffer injustices so terribly yes right Mm -hmm. and there's very little mercy for those above them who should be just right Mm -hmm. if you're a teacher and you screw it up they have very little mercy for that so Mm -hmm. you have to be absolute with your rules and then justly follow them all the time Mm -hmm. because if you're not you're in big trouble Okay, so why why not fear? Well, he says, those whom they fear, they hate. And whom one hates, one hopes to see him dead. <laughs> and sooner or later, that hatred will exert itself. The moment they have freedom, they will exert that hatred upon you. Yeah. And you yep. cannot keep them, you know, caged at all times. There's a, there's a really good quote. He says, freedom suppressed and again regained bites with keener fangs than freedom never endangered. Yep. It's a great quote. It's good. And those who would... I mean, this is practical for Jaguars, too. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Is this really a thing with no, you? No, no. Okay, well, I, was, I was really hoping. Man. So he, he says those who would be feared must eventually fears those, fear those who they in- intimidate. And this is yeah. absolutely true, totally. right? If I am a tyrant over my classes, I'm going to a fear that eventually they're going to tell their parents, they're going to revolt against me, that'll come back and... They're going to put hand sanitizer in your coffee. Yeah, it's going to come back to hurt you. The yeah. tax on your seat, like it's just not going to be a good situation. Mm-hmm. And he tells a story about a fella who had a wife that he didn't trust and he had to go into her with a barbarian with a bared sword and then searched through all her drawers for weapons before he spent time with her. Oh, gosh. She did eventually kill him. There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> she, he wasn't did, wrong. Did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she killed him because she thought he was cheating on her. Mm. Oh, okay. So I, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of trust in that relationship. Right. It wasn't a good situation. Sad. And then he kind of vaguely here references Caesar because he held people in fear. And then eventually those people revolted and mm. it ended in his murder. And then he has a whole bunch of stories about ways that they used to treat their allies. Like Rome used to fight for virtuous reasons and have people love Rome. And then eventually, when they became such a grand empire, they fought to continually hold those people in fear. And now they've sort of lost it. Hmm. And so here's what he says at the end of that. I'm going to skip the lengthy quote. He says, And so in Rome, only the walls of her houses remain standing. And even they wait now in fear of the most unspeakable crimes. But our republic we have lost forever. But to return to my subject, it is while we have preferred to be the object of fear rather than of love and affection that all these misfortunes have fallen upon us. Have you guys ever had an experience of being in competition with somebody or a school or a group or something and maybe you you lost to them, but um, they did it in such a like noble and gallant way that you and you actually loved, I mean, loved is a strong word, but you were, you know, had immense respect for them, even though they, they crushed you or they beat you or whatever. Uh, I was just you talking about that. I was just asking myself the question, wait, can you, can you be in war? Can you be in competition where the enemy ends up seeing how you carry yourself and respects you so much that like, I don't, I ain't even mad. I ain't mm-hmm. even mad. I got beat or, right. or whatever. I don't know. I, I 
I can't think of of an experience, maybe small ones of like sports teams where at the end they were magnanimous or whatever. Not personal ones, but yeah. King uh, Richard the Lionheart. Yeah, with Saladin. And, yeah. With Saladin. That's what I was thinking. You yeah. know, sending ice cream back and forth to each other. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Like they were definitely respectful. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the question is, if fear is no good and goodwill is the best, how do we win it? Right. How do we win men to our good side? Mm-hmm. He says there are three ways. Perfect. <laughs> he loves He's, these lists. I know. Yeah. He loves these lists. Yep. He's just totally into it. So affection or goodwill, confidence, and the mingled admiration and esteem of the people are his three. And he breaks them down. So goodwill through kind services you do to someone. And, you know, he says, you know, it's it's best if you can actually do the service. But if you intended oh, to and didn't enough. do it, you still get most of the credit. It's true. So that's a, that's a solid. Yeah. Um, and people are generally attracted to kindness, justice, honor, all the virtues. So in general, you win goodwill by being good and admirable. You win the confidence of people by if they think you have practical wisdom and justice. Which he, he, I think the most interesting thing under this head is when he talks about if you're going to have them separately, it's better to have justice. If you have wisdom mm-hmm. with no justice, it makes you shrewd, right? You're a contriver, sure. you're clever, and people suspect you. If you have justice without wisdom, they can still trust you with their lives and their property. You just might be kind of dumb, right? Yeah. So if or you're going like to have one or the other, it's better to have justice. And, and, you know, like, you know, flint edged. Like you are hard, you are hardcore, and you have no. But that's not, that wouldn't be just, right? Really? Can't justice, like, you know, too hot the eye of heaven well, doth maybe. burn? Because justice, if justice is a virtue, there's no excess of justice. So it would be giving people exactly what they deserve. Mm. Would that be flint-edged? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking of Cato. Mm. But was Cato too just? That wouldn't be the right way. Of he was it. just, like unflinching and unyielding um oh that's awesome we got a quote from cato later yeah oh man might be a different Cato. there's a lot of catos no he's probably the he's probably the cato that you were thinking the contemporary who also killed himself when when the republic fell he was like well i ain't sticking around for tyranny Mm. (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) all right and the the third way is the third thing is the esteem of your fellow men and this one is a little bit more lengthy he goes more into how to gain the esteem of your fellow men. He says, we esteem those with extraordinary talents, but we look down on those with no ability, no spirit, and no energy. So weirdly enough, we think ill of men who are slanderous and dangerous and unscrupulous, but unscrupulous, but we don't despise them. We despise those people who are of no use to their neighbors, the idle, lazy, and indifferent. So think of like yeah. the, maybe somebody across the the political spectrum from you that holds different ideals, but maybe conducts themselves. I mean, maybe they're dangerous. Maybe you think they're, they're a huckster, Mm -hmm. but at least it's better than like the 30 year old stoner down the street. Who's never held a steady job and Mm -hmm. doesn't do anything for anybody. Sure. Right. You despise one and you might be suspicious and kind of hate the, but it's right. You might think ill of him, but you're not going to despise him as a nothing. Yeah. So that was a fun one to sort of think about. Um, he says, uh, how, how much, time, how much time I got left? Plenty of time. Oh, 30, good. 35 right. minutes. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so in summation of how to get goodwill for all these things is just generally justice. It's the best way to get all three, be a just person. And he, so here's his quote, sort of in summation, how do we mm-hmm. get people to love, love us? Justice, mm-hmm. be just. So, so even, and I, and I quote, so even to a man who shuns society and to one who spends his life in the country. A reputation for justice is essential, even more so than to others. For they who do not have it, but are considered unjust, will have no defense to protect them, and so will be the victims of many kinds of wrong. So if you live in the country and people think you're unjust, uh, you don't even have friends to protect you, so you're in trouble. Jaguars. (laughs) (laughs) So also, to buyers and sellers, to employers and employed, and to those who are engaged in commercial dealings generally, justice is indispensable for the conduct of of business. I want to come to that, back to that because that's not necessarily still thought. Yeah, because think of it this way. Like if you're in a class of 30 kids and one kid does something that is outside the rules and 29 pairs of eyes look to you to see what you're going to do, if you give the one kid mercy, you have gained like the goodwill of one. Mm-hmm. But if you give justice, you've probably gained the goodwill of 29 because they mm-hmm. all now, you know, they all see that oh, there is law and order to this space. And, and, it, and it actually ends up becoming, creating 
a safe space. Maybe. Unless maybe that, <laughs> that, that's what we're looking for here. Unless maybe that poor kid just broke up with their boyfriend or girlfriend, in which case being too rigid. Well, for that was justice, my point. You yeah. to maybe told me that there's no such thing as too much justice. I would. I don't know that that's too much justice. I'd say. Well, don't they even? Yeah, it's too much rigidity. Is it? Is it just to not give mercy every now and again when it's when it's just to do so? One definition of justice is giving what one deserves. So in that action, they if deserve. One deserves mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Through their through whatever circumstance they're going through. All right. Well, then I, you have given me a sufficient loophole. Is that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. But yeah. Yeah, and he points out that even pirate kings in robber bands those guys gotta have justice yeah because if they get a bunch of money and they don't dole it out evenly That's oh it. they gonna get lynched you gotta right. get it you have to have a code a man's gotta got gotta have a code what's that from like a man's everything? gotta have a code <laughs> like every western Shoot. ever a man's gotta have a code what's that i can't remember but yeah every western ever but yeah anything that oh, has um, uh, is it from the it. wire i think it's from the wire i don't, yeah. I don't watch the wire that's what the first thing that pops nice. up when i google it yeah and that, that was a good show yeah it was so he points out that nations choose kings because they are just, mm. and they do it so that they can enjoy justice, right? So think about that. If you want to if you want to go high up the ladder, the nation will choose you because you are just, because you do just things, right? So that they can enjoy that same kind of justice. Do you think the children would crown us as kings of Veritas? I think are we just men? We are trying to be. Yeah. We are not perfect in it, but that's part of teaching is showing that we strive after something we don't always achieve so there's a justice in that of when we are wrong we seek to make it right i think there are some students who will who would respect that and you know want to crown as king or whatever but (laughs) i think it gets a little fuzzy when talking about students why because we're still training them up in that yes Hmm. um this because a part of what you're talking about because the the source of the respect you're talking about aj are other just people right like yeah. it's the it's the respect of people who you want respect from mm. and i think that matters also mm-hmm. and i think even like this is still reflected in elections even right even even elections that may have surprised you considering our last one so i think there was an element of like people feeling neglected by washington and i think that came back and said like we need justice too was mm. was part of the motivation behind this last election um i think there's a lot of a lot of justice in the political process that we don't think is there, but I think it's our, our natural bent to want to elect leaders who are just. And I think on both sides, uh, democratic and Republican people levied the injunction that the other side was not just right. So Hillary was accused of a bunch of stuff and Trump was accused of a bunch of, of, a bunch of stuff. And it was primarily aimed at proving that they were unjust or untrustworthy. So I, I think that it's, it's more important than you probably think it is. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a quote, he, he actually quotes Socrates in this. He says, the nearest way to glory, a shortcut, as it were, is to strive to be what you wish to be thought to right. be. For if any, he continues, for if anyone thinks that he can win lasting glory by pretense, mm. by empty show, by hypocritical talk and looks, he is very much mistaken. True glory strikes deep root and spreads its branches wide, but all pretenses soon fall to the ground like fragile flowers and nothing counterfeit can be lasting. And it's somewhere in here, I don't know if it's right here, but he talks about how you cannot have one virtue, right? He's like, it's kind of silly to talk about these separate because if you have one virtue, you have them all. And if you are lacking in one spot, it's going to, it's going to spread, right? Either you are going to become virtuous or you are going to become vicious, right? They don't come alone. Graham, what was that? You, you said a quote, uh, we just had our big retreat and our, our lovely Graham over here did some he did talking. A great job. He, did, yeah. he did a really good job. Yeah. One of it was you are going, one day you are going to become what you are becoming. Yep. Right. Which is true. And I think as, as high schoolers, it's hard to understand that, right? You can, you can dabble a little bit and not have it affect you so deeply, but put two decades on that progress. Mm -hmm. Right. And you will become what you are becoming. And so if you're, if you're heading down a road and that road leads to a place you don't think is good, you can't, you can't maintain. Yeah. Habits of behavior uh, are sort of get worn into your the way that you operate in the world so that like think about and then there's sort of a vicious cycle like lies beget lies like to keep up one lie you got to like have six or seven other lies well now you've developed a pretty good habit of lying if you want to hold up that lie for the next five ten fifteen years if it's a big enough lie that's that you need to sort of keep up then you're just going to have this huge habit of lying to the point where 
you can't remember what existing in the world without having to lie is, and now you are a liar. Right. Right. And, then, and that's true with all vices. It's also true with all virtues. And that's the thing is once you become a liar, it gives opportunity for other virtues to take root or other, sorry, other vices to take root. Like yeah. it's, it's not just going to stay that you are untruthful. You mm-hmm. will eventually become greedy and mm-hmm. envious and like it, it will spread. It can't just stick to one. Mm-hmm. Um, right. To review, goodwill, like goodwill is better than fear mm-hmm. and fear, bad love, good. good. And Correct. the best way to get those three is justice. Huh. That's, that's as, the far, as far as we've gotten. But he says, there's a problem, though. What if you're super just and you're really good and nobody knows? Mm. How do you make people around you know that you are good? How do you get a reputa- reputation? You just got to tweet it out. Yeah, there it is. Promote. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Marketing. Marketing <laughs> is the answer. Well, it's funny. He actually, he really gives cool. like some, here, here's how to do it, kid. Number one, military career. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Remember, this is Rome. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Doesn't it feel kind of wrong? Isn't he like using the military career to get something out of it? I don't know. I mean, it was the Roman way, right? I you want to you want to go high in Rome. Now it's military. showbiz, baby. I know. Well, maybe. Okay, let's go back to the military thing. I like that a little better. Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. Number two, uh, you can attach yourself to a man who is wise and renowned. So become a page or totally. an assistant. You know, get, get with those guys who understand what's going on and sort of head that way. Number three. That's why you guys are... Doing this podcast we're, we're here me, to be right? around you Graham. isn't that why yes. we're doing this yes, that 100 percent. I, I, I just oh i'm i'm aiming to eventually become second to <laughs> joe rogan that's my plan i'm well, gonna he's gonna be like this is the joe rogan podcast and i'll be like with aj and that'll be <laughs> good well have you heard that um there's this old spanish it's this phrase in spanish that i can't remember it in spanish but it translates to um like to the master goes the knife and it's this idea that eventually every um sort of um, apprentice has to best their master and if the master doesn't make it possible for the apprentice to best him naturally the apprentice is going to do it it's going to manifest itself in like the apprentice supplanting killing, the master yeah. either killing him or just getting a better career than him and mm-hmm. and sort of you know uh, and so the, the phrase is to the, to the master goes the knife or something like that is that al maestro cuchillada to the master goes the knife there you go that sounds so, so ominous which is gracias yeah, <laughs> I found it on Twitter, so it must be real. He also says that the so the third way is conversation and oratory. So be in the courts, help the people, right? You can you tweet can help out. folks. Yeah, tweet it out. <laughs> Although he says you should never be a prosecutor ever. Uh, really? You should be a defender. So here's here's his quote. <laughs> this, this, yeah. Again, the following rule of duty is to be carefully conserved or observed. Never prefer a capital charge against any person who may be innocent, for that cannot possibly be done without making oneself a criminal. For what is so unnatural as to turn to the ruin and destruction of good men, the eloquence bestowed by nature for the safety and protection of our fellow men. So turning your own eloquence to the downfall of another, especially in the courts, is to be despised. But how can he how can he rectify that with a sense of justice? Like at some point you need to prosecute the bad. Well, someone who may be people hate defense attorneys for like slime balls. <laughs> right. Someone who may be innocent. I, and this is that's mm. the funny thing is now we've sort of switched. Yeah, defense I, attorneys I are the so. ones who are crummy and now it's prosecutors mm-hmm. who are seen as upholding the state and defending the state. It's weird. I think our mm. court system is probably a little different than theirs was. Sure. It also depends if you're defending people who are probably guilty, yeah. right? Wouldn't he probably say you shouldn't defend people who are guilty? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yep, yep. Mm. Wow. But but then even then you you are seen as a defender of your fellow man, right? You are helping another, yeah, rather than prosecuting someone yourself. Gotcha. Yeah. And I was going to ask, what is the what is the modern equivalent of like what is the best way to, I guess, what do they call this? Like virtue, virtue signal, is that what virtue signal. Oh. But you no, know, virtue signaling is a negative thing. It's where you don't actually have the virtue. You just sort of realize where people. You just sort of, you you can graft yourself onto the cultural. You're basically a rent seeker at that point. Yeah. So what's the best way to what's, what's the best way to be a rent seeker? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I right. refuse to take part in this conversation. What's what's the best way to make sure that people know what you really are? If you are virtuous, hmm. how do you make sure that like and you want to go far yeah. in your career? How do you make sure people know? That's a great question. What are the avenues? What are the avenues to uh, Twitter? I don't. Is it is it Twitter is how you show so your personal greatness? No, my reaction to all of it this is the Benedictine in me. That's like, why are we, why bother? Like, isn't it better just to be good than to be perceived as good? Like, I, I, don't know. I, I, I have sympathies for that argument that also, it, 
I always think that cream will rise to the top eventually. And so whatever sphere you find yourself in, like the quality of the men, quality of quality of men is going to reveal itself eventually. Um, this is also why I sort of jokingly, when we were doing the Plantagenet podcast around, I think it was President's Day, I jokingly tweeted like we should, no, Thanksgiving, just be thankful that we are not men in power. Just because mm, like yeah. you are, when you're in the public eye, um, uh, um, I don't know. It's it's just your own in your own ill temperance or whatever. Your own personal vices are going to be magnified and picked over. Um, but I don't know, AJ. What do you think it is? If someone if someone was wanting to, um, uh, I guess this is he's he's advocating for public life. Like he's talking yes. about how does somebody gather esteem in the populace in the mm-hmm. Republic of Rome so that they can wield some kind of clout and power. And I. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, I think you need. Otherwise, if you don't have good men wanting to wield clout and power, you will have bad men wielding clout and power. Um, um, but I, I also have Benedictine sympathies, Thomas, which is like, well, you know, let, let, it, let, it go. let the dead bury the dead. Yep. <laughs> and uh, um, But I kind of feel like it's... I jokingly said show business, but isn't that, isn't that the answer? Ooh. Yeah, doesn't that feel awkward? It feels terrible. Yeah. Or and it's hard to do it in the twenty four hour news cycle because oh, even if well. you say the most wonderful things, people will soundbite it, yeah. and then you know binders of women will go viral. No, where, sure. While all oh, the other man. stuff you said is gonna be fine. <laughs> or now we're in the world of deep fakes, right? You know what deep fakes are, don't mm-hmm. you? Sure. That's where you uh, like pretend like you're gonna shoot and then go around him and it breaks his ankles. Right? No, no. What? Uh, that's, it's a that, deep fake. That's in basketball. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, a deep fake is like. <laughs> or a, like in football, when you're gonna throw it really far, but you don't. You throw it really close. <laughs> Do you yeah. fake, yeah. faked going deep? <laughs> um, no, this is where you have like learning algorithms who can very easily mimic the voice, the voice mimic. and the facial uh, features of somebody in a video. So if we, oh, I've seen these. Yeah. So if somebody, if we started recording our podcasts vid- uh, with a video, some like you know, fifteen-year-old kid could download all these videos and then have us sitting there. On, like on a fake news desk <laughs> just saying just things swearing. like, yeah, yeah, just saying terrible things and like plotting bomb threats and all kinds of terrible stuff. And yeah. then we get fired. Yeah. From our free podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, deep fakes. So maybe. I've always had a fear that a student was just going to make like a soundboard of, of take of sentences that we've said and take them out of context. Sometimes students will bring up things that I've said in class. And I'm like, oh, uh, <laughs> do a little shirt tug and hope they're not, you know, Paying spreading it around. Yeah. Yeah. Or there's a video file that just gets email to us is like give me an a or this file goes <laughs> live everyone. it's just like i like but <laughs> and it's just like completely why, why did you do that completely why taken out s- of context uh, <laughs> oh crap i just well, yeah what's the right context for that yeah seriously. he doesn't even have to shop it together <laughs> yeah, now right like, it's just it's just gonna take it straight out <laughs> oh, and you know how many sound clips of us saying duty there oh, are now? Yeah, seriously what have we done oh yeah I we're, so i don't know if i would call it show business but something <clears throat> creating some type of content putting it I think online is the right place for it. So something like a podcast, mm-hmm. something like a blog, something like YouTube, something like what you're looking. I'm just saying, is that what we're doing right now? K- kind. I mean, Hannenberg Magby 2020. There it is. <laughs> Wait, why aren't you in this? I do run, run for sure. Uh, oh, you can't run. Sorry. I'm that, so sorry. I can't I run. Yeah. Sorry. I'm a, <laughs> I don't mean to rub it in. Sorry. I'm an immigrant. You can be an advisor. They have those, right? Yeah. President. Cloak well, <laughs> well, and dagger back channels. Come on, guys. Clearly we're qualified Presidential advisor? Yeah. Those good. can be foreign, right? If, I, if sure. my fantasy I novels I tell no me anything, idea. your advisor can be foreign. <laughs> good. Great. So, I'm, a, I'm the fox from... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, was, I was listening to a, a talk from a guy. Oh, he's the... He's, um, last name's Wilson. He, he founded um, New St. Andrews, and he's doing a series of talks on, like, why he founded the school and why... I mean, why classical, why Christian, things like that. Anyway, he had this th- he had this idea where he's like, everyone should write, well, people should write books, and then you should see what type of person reads your books. And that's a reflection to you of the type of person you are. So it seems same, like a lot of effort to figure out what kind of people... Well, st- well think of it like this you. way. Like when, I don't, you know, I, I'm super impressed with the emails that we get. And so some part of yeah. me is like, I am, I'm humbled whenever we get emails and how thoughtful they are and how... Mostly because it seems like those people are way smarter, smarter than, than us. Mm-hmm. Totally smarter. Yeah. Better, we get, better, we get emails from MDivs yeah. and people who really know their stuff. Better read than I'm us, like, better educated. I stop yeah. talking about this stuff. Yeah, but I think that... I don't know the right way to say it, but if you're going to do a podcast, that's 
the kind of person you want listening to it. And so that's a piece of your answer. You see who respects you, who listens to you by putting something out there and then seeing what the response back is. So we got like an email that was like, I love lip gloss too. Yeah, yeah. We were like, oh crap. We're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, we should just end this whole thing. Yeah. I, I'm liking the quotes that you're putting on here. If you could do some more, I could do some ringtones. So that would be great. My lip gloss be cool. <laughs> Thank you. Be popping. My lip gloss Yours. be popping. So I'm both yeah, I guess it is cool. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I was, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I questioned your knowledge of the lip gloss be popping song. What you know about me? <laughs> Apparently nothing. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you. The next next bit he wants to talk about is service, right? Serving people. How do we do it? What's the best way to serve people? Let me let me ask you a question. Should I give money mm. or deeds? Deeds. Deeds. Why deeds? Why not money? Because money seems like the right answer, so it must be the wrong one. Because um, it's got the personal touch. I don't know. You have people, if they see you doing stuff, I feel like, they, yeah, maybe people would think that giving money is cheap and deeds are more costly or show, uh, reveal more of a heart for the specific person or thing that you're doing deeds for. Okay. All right. Here's what Cicero says. The manner of showing it is twofold. Your generosity, he means. Kindness is shown to the needy either by personal service or by gifts of money. The latter way is the easiest, especially for a rich man. It's true. Yeah. But the former is nobler and more dignified and more becoming to a strong and eminent man. For although both ways alike betray a generous wish to oblige, still in the one case the favor makes a draft upon one's bank account, in the other upon one's personal energy. And the bounty which is drawn from one's material substance tends to exhaust the very fountain of liberality. Liberality is thus forestalled by liberality. For the more people one is helped with gifts of money, the fewer one can help. So basically, if you give money, eventually you're going to run dry, right? The more money you give, the less you can. But if people are generous and kind in the way of personal service, that is, with their ability and personal effort, various advantages arise. First, the more people they assist, the more helpers they will have in works of kindness. It's true. And second, by requiring the habit of kindness, they are better prepared and in better training, as it were, for bestowing favors upon many. I love the point that the more people you help, the more helpers there are. Mm -hmm. Right? I think that's great. And an an awesome little quote that comes a little bit later. One's purse, then, should not be closed so tightly that a generous impulse cannot open it, nor yet so loosely held as to be open to everybody. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So you should be a little bit judicial about where you spend your money. You should still give those. Just be smart about it. And he says, of those who give money, there's two types, the lavish and the generous. In Rome, you know, they used to throw games and glad- gladiator stuff and big mm-hmm. parties and that sort of thing. He says, those are the lavish. And people generally forget it almost yep. immediately as it happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? You go to a big party, you have a good time, you get drunk, you wake up the next morning, and that person has spent $10,000 and you barely remember the generosity. You're like, I think the guy's name was so-and-so whose house I was at. I can't remember. Yeah, who yeah. knows? Whereas the generous, if they give it for real material gain, right, to lift you out of poverty, to help you give a dowry for your kid, something like that. Santa Claus. Santa, yeah. yeah, Santa Claus, exactly. Or you give it to the community, right? You build a new pool hall that anybody can use. They are, they'll remember that forever. Pool hall? Yeah, the good old-fashioned Veritas <laughs> pool hall. That's... No, we don't have one of those. And a saloon. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel mocked. <laughs> Put them up with your fisticuffs. <laughs> I don't know, like a like a neighborhood pool. You you buy your neighborhood a pool. Oh, there you go. Oh, they're yeah. gonna be thankful. That's yeah, right. they will. Yeah, yeah. So he says that's the best way to do it. And as Hall for pools, <laughs> as for your actions, some of the best you can give with you know with not spending money is legal counsel and oration. Hmm. Right, helping people vocally. I don't know if that's as much now as it used to be, right? How often do I get the chance for legal action? I'm no lawyer, right? If you're not a lawyer, that avenue is kind of closed to you, Mm -hmm. right? Except maybe as a witness. And how often does your oration really help anybody? No. Rarely. I mean, maybe conversationally, right? But Uh, Weddings. Like if you're giving speeches. Right. If you're your best man speech. Right, sure. So once in a lifetime. (laughs) Very good. (laughs) Yeah, so so very very rarely. I, so what is what sorts of actions can you do now that those hmm. two are close to you that don't necessarily require your money? What ways can we do? Yeah, what, what ways can you give actions? I think like help people build stuff. Uh-huh. Like just general labor is mm-hmm. a good one, right? I mean that might not be as material ben- as materially beneficial as helping them with their legal stuff. Mm. Like I can't do that. Cicero could. I can't. But I certainly can go help somebody move on a weekend, mm-hmm. right? That's the kind yeah. of thing that, and they'll remember you are, 
super generous if you come and work for 10 hours straight lifting their couch. It's true. But if you had given them, say, like 200 bucks for a moving service, they'd forget that. Yeah. Right? Or it wouldn't have less, it wouldn't leave as deep an impact as you yeah. were. Yeah, your friendship you wouldn't working. be as... Yeah. As built. Well, boys, I'm going to remember this as uh, uh, someone who is currently building a house. Oh, no. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll we just signed play up? back on this podcast to uh, appeal to the angels of your better natures. All right. Another question. Okay. <laughs> is it better to give to the rich or to the poor? I mean, like, uh, do, do deeds for men who are Ooh. wealthy or men who have nothing? Nothing. But men who are wealthy can help do you, more better, for you can do more for you. But, like, so people who are well off have lots of people who are offering them things it's true or giving them free Mm -hmm. things people who get free things don't need them and so if you're doing it for those who can't help you in return like people will notice that and that will mean more well ever since you became an instagram influencer Uh i know you've been getting free like weight loss tea yeah it's been the best yeah um, there's weight loss tea i don't know sure all that that, i'm never running again that garbage (laughs) on on instagram Yeah, and all those free clothes from being an Instagram That's influencer. Right. Yeah. It's the best. Yeah. Love Instagram. <laughs> I've posted three photos on Instagram in my life. Uh, the last I've one. posted zero, and <laughs> Instagram is my favorite thing ever. Yes, but that's because you follow cat pictures. Uh, dog memes, uh-huh. the onion, the Babylon Bee, and fail blog. Yeah, that sounds great. It's So it's just a joy to scroll through. It's just yeah. my birthday every day. I don't, even, I don't follow <laughs> friends. There's no fear of missing out. I'm yeah. not jealous of anyone's life because everyone that I see is failing. Oh. Uh, so it's, it's great. great. It's, it's just constant joy. It's pups you got, I and think you got fails. the internet figured out, Hannenberg. Yeah, yeah I try. Okay, so... So what was it? Is it the rich the, or the poor? The answer is the poor. Well, what uh, up? If you give to the rich, you they could suspect that you are doing it for favors. Oh, that was your point. Yeah. And they could feel that they deserve it. Hmm. right you are just doing this because i'm rich and you want a friend right so they're not going to show the exact same gratitude if you give it to the men who can't give it back to you that's better and even makes a distinguish distinction between like the wealthy and the good you should always Hmm. give it to a good man and he has a fun little quote he says but if it comes to a conflict of duty on this point i must i should say follow the advice of themistocles when someone asks for his advice whether he should give his daughter in marriage to a man who was poor but honest or to one who is rich but less esteemed, he said, for my part, I prefer a man without money to money without a man. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. dang. That's so good. Oh, I thought that was oh. so good. So good. Yeah. Oh, I'm stealing that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then he has a big lengthy thing about how do you give to the state, and unless you're a statesman, it doesn't matter much, but basically protect individual rights. He was super against property tax, hmm. thought that was horrible. He said the point of the government is to protect individual property rights. Right. Which if you think about it, it kind of is protect the borders and protect your property. And the reason you protect the borders is to protect protect your property. property, That's what all justice is. And so he says, avoid self-seeking. Generally, don't be greedy. Like if you overthrow another town and you bring all that back for your community, don't take any yourself because then you're giving it all right. You're generous to the general populace and make sure people pay their debts. And I think this was actually a jab at Caesar, Mm. who, when people fought in his wars, he would come back and take land and give it to the people who fought for him. Mm. And so he is like making sure people don't pay their debts and he would get rid of debts for the populace. And of course, those people would love him Mm -hmm. because they didn't have to pay their their mortgage. But he says like, that's the very foundation of a good society is making sure debts are paid. And in in America, like our whole financial system is based on debt. So Mm -hmm. you have to kind of make sure that it's it's happening. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. We're near the end here. So to review... Basically, what's better, love or fear? Totally love. <laughs> Fear's bad. Good. And you want to be esteemed by people. You want to have their respect. And the best way to do that is works of service uh, and generally being just. And how you get your reputation out there is apparently Hollywood now, I guess. <laughs> For us, anyway. And then the last thing is... It's a bummer. How it do is. you tell... Which thing is better than, like he says, of all these things, right, you can always, you'll always have choices about which is better, right? Should I do this or should I do that? Which is more expedient? Which one will make people love me more, I guess, in this case? And he doesn't really say much on this head. He he just says it'll happen, that you'll have to choose. Hmm. And then he gives a quote. To this class of comparisons belongs that famous saying of old Cato's. So here's Cato Hmm. coming back for you. When he was asked what was the most profitable profitable feature of an estate, he replied, raising cattle successfully. (laughs) What next to that? Raising cattle with fair success. <laughs> <laughs> and next, raising cattle with slight success. And fourth, raising crops. And when his questioner said, how about money lending? Cato replied, 
How about murder? (laughs) And from this, as well as many other incidents, we ought to realize that expediencies have often to be weighed against one another and that it is proper for us to add this fourth division in the discussion of moral duty. So he's like, sometimes that'll happen. And he doesn't really give you any guidelines for how to do it. So I wanted to end kind of coming back to a question you asked earlier, which is, isn't, isn't it kind of Silly, oh. yeah, self-seeking to try to get your reputation out there. Because once you become a virtuous man, do you like you shouldn't want all that anyway? Mm-hmm. If greed is not a part of your person, and you are indifferent to your outer circumstances, what's the point of shopping all that around? Right? Is isn't that, are there a weird conflict? Doesn't all this yes. seem kind of silly? All of this effort, all of this making men love you to secure glory, reputation, and wealth that if you are virtuous, you don't want. I don't agree with what I'm about to say, but maybe one way to answer it would be someone has to rule a city. This is what Graham said earlier. Someone has to rule a city, might as well be a virtuous person. Someone needs to be captain of industry, might as well be a virtuous person. That society is better for having these type of people in command, in control, than having the vicious in those positions. But my thought is, this makes me think of the Athenian lawmaker Solon. So when they went to him, and they asked him to be king. He said no. Nope. Yeah, just like David. Yeah, I want to I want to raise my crops. You right. guys leave me alone. I want to be virtuous by myself and being a statesman only brings danger and care. Right? I, all I can do is get scared of everything and be worried all the time. That sounds awful. And they actually, I think under arms, compelled him to be king. Like went and got him and said if you're not king, you're in trouble. And I I can't help but think that for virtuous men they will be put in those sorts of positions. You'll be elected by CEO boards. You will be promoted by committees. You'll be elected Pope, right? Like that's kind of the thing that happens. And isn't it a shame that we give our highest positions to those men who most most disastrously want it? You know what I mean? The men who want money the most are the ones that we put in charge of our companies. And what can we call that but greed? So... I think I don't agree with these. What I'm about to say on this either. So, which means I probably just shouldn't. Say we need like some it. sort You're of a fascinating psychological study. Maybe thanks. We need a bell that you can ring when you're playing Devil's Advocate. I'm not, so I'm just, not even Devil. I, <laughs> that's the worst. That's the um bell. Which for the few times I sub in AJ's class, I get that rung at me all the time. It's unfortunate. So I think we are made for more than. There are seven and a half minutes left in this podcast, so I'm not. I'm going to drop a bomb and then walk away. I think we're made for more than just our own personal virtue and personal actions. I think that's the first thing we need to tame to prepare us to exist well in the world. But AJ, you, one of your quotes earlier said something about the glory of man. Some um, Cicero was saying something about how like we're supposed to, there's supposed to be glory in us. And I think there's something to that of, Yes, we need to tame ourselves, tame our hearts, um, deal with our own sin, vi- uh, vice, whatever. But then we're supposed to do something with it. And I think there is a greatness that we are called to. There, we are supposed to achieve things. And we are, it is insufficient to only de- deal with myself. When I'm, uh, as an example, I'm married. And if I were only a super virtuous man, this is um, A.W. Tozer. I think it's Tozer. No. Yeah, I think it's Tozer was um, super holy man, wrote, what's the Tozer book? Do y'all know this guy? Um, yes. A.W. He wrote, um, oh, shoot. The Pursuit of God? Is Pursuit that? of, no. Isn't it? Pursuit of God? Um, uh, why is this so annoying? Whatever. He wrote Pursuit of God. Mm-hmm. Is that what you just said? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he wrote a book, Pursuit of God. It's really great. But A.W. A. Hoser was married. He was married, and he, he loved God, but he did not love his wife well. He was cold, and he was distant to her. So he himself was holy in that sense of being like virtuous, and like he proclaimed God, and that was great. But he wasn't a good husband. A.W. Tozer died. His wife eventually remarried, and I don't remember the guy's name. If it, the the the, kick, the kicker to the story is that the wife said that whoever the second husband was. Um, A.W. To- she would say, my first husband loved God, but my second husband loves me. And I, I think there's... What I would say is that I could... I mean, I'm not necessarily leveling this uh, at A.W. Tozer himself, but how could we call a man like that virtuous? 
right? That's he, he would both lack both love and charity. Is but, my point. Yeah. So I'm saying that <clears throat> there is a type of virtue that exists just within the person, but then, I mean, when we when we throw around the word virtue, the word virtue means excellence. And so excellence doesn't only exist on a moral plane. Excellence exists on a physical plane. We are in a building right now and we need a virtuous building. We need an excellent building to be in and we need excellent builders to build that building. Does that, Mm -hmm. there's more than just us being moral beings. There's also us being active. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that's, that's, that all coincides with everything I've been saying about virtue. I think you set up a system. So, I mean, like if, if we look back to book one, remember the second part was maintaining maintaining a good social structure. Right? Yeah. Your job is to be kind to your fellow men. That is part of your duty as a virtuous man. Yeah, so it's not only our job to be um, atomized, individual, mm-hmm. moral beings. We are to be moral communities also, but not only moral. We need to make good shoes for each other. We need to make good crops for each other. Like there's more, there's more to virtue than just the moral aspect of it. Yeah, this is why, um, from what I understand about the American system is it was an incent. You sort of incentivized the um, sort of virtuous landowner to spend time in Congress. Like, okay, now for the next three, six years, however long your term is, I'm going to go and I'm going to be, I'm going to represent my community in, you know, in the government for the set period of time. And you sort of instilled, I, I, I think if you had, um, maybe less of a, if it was less easy to be able to stay in government for the entirety of your career. So if you had like, if you had term limits and also coupled that with a strong sense of personal responsibility or civil responsibility um, 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 in, in the populace and you had, if, if we sort of measured the success of our democracy by the amount of turnover that we had in, in the government, by the, the the sheer volume of different kinds of people representing their communities in in the Senate and in the Congress, like there's something that seems virtuous about that. So you would have less rent seekers or less career politicians who are doing it for self aggrandizement, and you would have it. You would have more people doing this out of a a sense of duty, and they're saying, okay, I'll put in my six years, and then I'm done, and then mm-hmm. you can't ask anything of me again. I'm going to go back to sort of my private affairs, and um, uh, I so. We have the, uh, we sort of have the systems that's set up for something like that to happen more so than say, you know, 17th century France. Sure. So, right. um, but whether or not we we are producing enough um, of the citizenry that have that sense of burden and civic responsibility is, I don't think we do. Um, but um, <clears throat> well, the funny thing is, according to Plato, Socrates said that the man who actually wants to pursue pursue virtue cannot have a position in the state yeah which uh, we can talk about on another day it, it shows up in his apology but mm-hmm. i think that's probably going to be after we finish you know cicero that's what i'm gonna do next mm-hmm. but cool. yeah he says that there pretty much can be no virtuous yeah. statesman i've always found campaigning to be slightly kind of off-putting even no no matter how virtuous or how like noble you think the the person campaigning is it's it always just sort of rings a little blah to me Sure. Um, for okay. this very reason. So to, to bring it all together, you know, be nice to people. And that's Good. the best way to get the things that you got coming to you. And yeah. that's my last bit of moralizing. You know, do be the thing that you want everyone to think you are. And that's that's the way to go for it. So moralizing over. I'm gonna go get some ice cream or something. <laughs> but as, as you know, I go through my own personal inventory. It doesn't hurt to do your own. So cool. that's the last of it. We have... Thanks, Bert. Some, oh, we b- boys have a classical stuff we got wrong that we got wrong. So in fact, we were right. And Hannenberg, this goes back to you, and this goes all the way back to an off-the-cuff comment you made. So I have been reading the history of the American Civil War, and there are definitely, definitely Tennessee Yankees. Oh. So <laughs> Hannenberg, if you said a Tennessee Yankee in King Arthur's court, even though that wasn't you, the title were, of the book. It was not the title of the book. There that are. being said, there, there are. were definitely Tennessees, Tennesseans, Tennesseans who fought for the Union Ten- Army. Tunisians? Tunisians. <laughs> that sounds about right. If you're from Tennessee, can you let us know exactly <laughs> what, what us, yeah. is it? Tunisian? Tennessean? <laughs> I like Tunisian. That's my favorite. Uh, people from Tennessee who fought for the Union who would definitely be called Yankees. 
Fair, fair well, enough. So, you, you I were, feel you so were, good. Guess that you were very excited to share this one. That uh, I feels just. I feel like. It's, so, a new, it's a new dawn, boys. Right now, it's about a 50-50 toss-up if I edit in Vindicated by, <laughs> by Dashboard Confessional. I'll be disappointed if you don't. <laughs> vindicated, I am. All right, well, I think you want to close this out, Greg? Oh, yeah. So, thank you, everybody. This has been Classical Stuff You Should Know with Thomas, AJ, and Graham uh, thinking about the aughts in our life. I hope that this has um, at least got you interested in going and reading some Cicero. I know definitely it's got me going yeah. interested in wanting to read some Cicero, and I never have. In my mind, he is dry and boring, but... Uh, you might not be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, um, it's pretty rough, But I I'm think I'll, I'll, still, uh, I'll still struggle through. So, uh, you can tweet at us at uh, uh, classical stuff at Twitter. Um, uh, you can tweet your own self-aggrandizement if you like. And if you do, we will like it or retweet it if we agree with it. If we think you are virtuous, <laughs> then we you are deserve virtuous, our We will give you, we will pump your tires. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you, have you ever uh, heard want that expression? I've never heard that. That's a Canadian that. expression. Okay. Um, if you want to email us, you can email us at classical stuff at veritasacademy.net and we will eventually get back to you. Yep. Um, and uh, you can find these episodes at classicalstuff.net or on any disseminator of podcasts except spotify i don't know yeah spotify is weird and i'd say that the biggest reason to go to classicalstuff.net is i pick a painting for every episode Mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. so most of those have to do with the actual subject matter or our depictions of the some sort of thing some sort of uh, beautiful work of art i've got to find three separate ones on cicero (laughs) i believe in you yikes yeah um buckle up for googling okay (laughs) um this is classical stuff signing off bye signing off bye